John, welcome to Yale, and thank you for taking the time uh, to participate in the cor course Faith and Globalization as well as in this interview. You're one of the world's foremost experts in uh, religion and rights, and this is what I would like to talk to you uh, about. Um, when one thinks about globalization and human rights, some people say that uh, human rights language is kind of the new moral language of uh, planetary uh, scope. Uh, is that how it strikes you as well? I think that's how it started. It, uh, in 1948, when the Universal Declaration was passed, I mean, the world was looking very desperately to codify a new moral language uh, to substitute for the languages of Christianity, the Enlightenment, and other faith traditions that had betrayed themselves in the course of the early part of the 20th century. The world had just stared into mm. Hitler's gulags and death camps. The world had just been through a world, world war. Um, the world was struggling to try to find uh, some way of, of delivering on the failed promises of Christianity and the Enlightenment. Uh, mm. Christianity had promised the return of Christ. Christ had not returned. The Enlightenment had promised the withering away of the state through the socialist experiment that hadn't occurred. Uh, the Enlightenment had also promised a heavenly city of reason that hadn't occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, mm -hmm. we had World War, gulags, the Holocaust, mm -hmm. uh, and the worst totalitarian disasters in, in the history of mankind. And the world, as a consequence, was looking for uh, a new vocabulary to think about the basic goods that had to be achieved in a society, uh, the basic rights mm -hmm. a person could count on, uh, the basic ingredients of what human dignity, reason, conscience would uh, ultimately uh, ensure. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was one way of codifying a new moral language for the world community and identifying the starting point for a conversation about what it means to live together as persons and peoples. Now, now the, 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 the great uh, upheavals that you mentioned in the middle of the uh, and uh, latter part of the 20th, middle of the 20th century, um, have not replicated themselves in quite the same uh, the, the, the same uh, extent uh, in the beginning of 21st, but nonetheless, it's mm -hmm. very much a conflict-ridden 21st century. Do you think that we continue to need uh, a kind of moral, common moral language in the global world today, or are the more impersonal processes replace some such need? I do think we still need a moral language, but I also think we need to have implementation of the moral ideals of that moral language. Mm -hmm. I think we had 25 or 30 years of very prominent human rights declarations in the 1940s to the 1960s and early 70s. Uh, but what we move toward now is trying to make those human rights ideals uh, instantiated on the ground, vindicated in local communities, a part of the culture, uh, uh, both of world uh, and international relations, but also uh, the realization of rights on the ground became important. And I think in the 21st century that the need for a universal language, which becomes a starting point for dialogue, and the need for uh, providing a ground on which parties can press claims uh, to both protect themselves, to receive entitlements that they haven't received. Uh, rights provides one such vocabulary. It can't be the be-all and end-all of, of all mm -hmm. vocabularies of moral interaction. It cannot substitute for uh, the kind of interstitial work that goes on uh, within families, within communities, within neighborhoods, within churches, within other faith uh, traditions. Uh, but it is a useful language to think about as a starting point that people can hold in common. It depends, though, upon uh, languages uh, of moral fervor uh, that are maintained by faith communities among others. It depends ultimately upon local political and cultural and social conditions on the ground to implement mm. those ideals. In many ways, human rights serves as, serve as middle axioms of our discourse, somewhere between the higher natural law and other transcendent ideas that religious and cultural communities maintain, but above the local communities uh, mm -hmm. and their actions with respect to the protection of persons and people's lives, properties. Um, and it provides a check on excess at the local level, and it provides an instrument for the implementation of ideals uh, at the transcendent level. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think human rights really is still a useful vocabulary, uh, right. but it can't be monopolistic. Right, but if one, uh, would it be correct to say, as some people have suggested, that um, were Declaration on Human Rights to be voted today in UN, I mean the 1948 one, it probably wouldn't pass, have, wouldn't pass. Mm -hmm. uh, the world has become more complex, uh, a wide variety of processes have gone, uh, gone on. 
uh, and some of the uh, some of the the, the, the the rights enshrined in that uh, in the declaration may not quite be as universally shared. Would that be uh, is that how you read the situation, or have we made steady progress to implementation of those uh, those rights? So where where are we mm. from forty eight to today? I think the uh, rights paradigm is is as tenuous today as it was in 1948. Mm. I mean, there's a wonderful story of Jacques Maritain, uh, the UNESCO representative who participated actively in the in the formulation and ultimately the passage of the Universal Declaration. And after the declaration was passed 60 years ago, they interviewed in a, in a media context, uh, Father Maritain asked him, well, how was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights passed? I mean, with this great uh, mm. collection of various cultures and religious communities and intellectual traditions represented at the table. Mm. How ultimately did you get this to pass? And he said, well, we could agree on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as long as we did not ask why. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a telling comment about how tenuous the, the mm. human rights mm. paradigm was in 1948. And I dare say uh, that persists in the ensuing 60 years and would persist to this day. Mm. I think one of the burdens of the human rights um, movement is to be ever inclusive of new voices, new values, new visions, new ideals that were not part of the discussion in 1948. The Asian traditions, the traditional religions, uh, non-Abrahamic faiths were mm. not actively represented mm. in the formulation of the 1948 Universal Declaration. And those communities have values and ideals that I think have to be taken into account if the human rights paradigm is continued to have salience. But what human rights does it provides communities in the West and the non-West with a mirror in which to reflect uh, on their own values, their own ideals, to see a normative totem uh, and to see a normative framework that allows them to reflect upon their own faith traditions, their own cultural traditions, their own canonical statements uh, about the good life and the good society. And oftentimes it provides an alternative vocabulary uh, that mm. is consonant with, sometimes even goes beyond and sometimes is, is gone beyond by canonical formulations in the original texts. And so in the Christian tradition, we have these wonderful statements uh, about what Christian freedom means. In the canonical statements of, of the Quran and the Hadith, there are wonderful statements about embracing brothers and sisters. Uh, in the Jewish tradition about covenant duty and responsibility uh, of a people before God, these are alternative ways of thinking about ideals uh, that the human rights paradigm articulates in bald terms and that in many ways provides uh, a mirror to reflect uh, on one's own faith tradition. You know, pre presumably, presumably one of the reasons for the pessimism of uh, some folks in terms of the possibility of the passage of, uh, of Universal Declaration uh, today has to do uh, with the precise, precise nature of the relationship between uh, kind of moral claims embodied in that declaration and in the tradition of human rights and uh, religions as overarching interpretations mm -hmm. of life. They sometimes, at mm -hmm. least some people, say that these are two or multiple mm -hmm. competing moral, moral codes. And the question is, which one has the ultimacy? I think for the individual person in his or her own prayer closet, certainly the faith tradition has the ultimate uh, superior, superior claim uh, on that person. Mm -hmm. And in many faith communities, it's, it's the faith community's own canon, and its own creed, its mm -hmm. own cult, its own uh, code of conduct that has to trump but in, in many ways, what human rights are, are the, are the lubricant for uh, non-faith communities, political communities, uh, voluntary associations, and it provides a set of basic starting points for how they interact as persons, a set of basic ideals uh, that they can claim for themselves. Um, the, the, the language of human rights uh, can be cast as simply an enlightenment product that privileges the individual over community, that privileges greed over charity, uh, that privileges uh, entitlement to duty. Uh, and there are certain formulations of human rights in the history of the West, especially from the Enlightenment forward, that would lend themselves to that interpretation. And there are certain provisions in the human rights paradigm today uh, that would seem to privilege that kind mm -hmm. of understanding of human rights. But the human rights paradigm is very wide, it's very varied, uh, and has a variety of different understandings of what it means to uh, be a person in community. Uh, basic basic uh, freedoms of faith, of speech, of press, of assembly. Mm -hmm. uh, these are not antithetical to uh, faith traditions. These, in fact, are essential to the exercise of those faith traditions. Basic rights to provision, to work, to welfare, uh, to respect, to one's dignity, uh, to a name, to a home, to, mm -hmm. to succor and sanctuary. Uh, these, are not, these are basic rights that are protected by the human rights paradigm, 
they are consonant with and indeed flow out of religious traditions mm -hmm. rather than antithetical to them. So there are ways of, of showing overlapping consensus between the moral languages implicit in the human rights paradigm mm -hmm. and the explicit moral languages developed by a variety of faith communities. And I think it's at the overlapping consensus stage that we have to engage mm -hmm. in the question about faith and freedom and how they work together. Now this overlapping consensus can happen also between the systems uh, that for particular communities hold ultimacy, like religious, mm -hmm. uh, various sure. religious groups. Um, you you write uh, that the uh, human rights uh, as such are not a fundamental belief system. Uh, indeed, in, even in this interview, you have right. lodged it somehow yeah. as a middle axiom. Right? right? Could could you explicate that relationship between uh, between uh, broader uh, and more overarching uh, accounts of the good uh, life, uh, which maybe religious traditions mm. also uh, represent, and uh, human rights and how they should be conceived in regard to these. Yeah. In, in the Western tradition, which is where I spend most of my time uh, reading, there's a classic distinction between the natural law or jus naturale, uh, the common law or the jus gentium, and the civil law, or the jus civile, three layers of legal authority, mm -hmm. with the highest being the most transcendent, the lowest being uh, the most local and, and malleable and transient. Uh, the natural law set forth transcendent ideals, transcendent norms, basic goods about life. The civil law implemented at the local level uh, how one governs one's local community given local conditions. And in between those two, uh, there was the common law, which is the set of common things that people have learned through trial and error, through experience, through reflections on nature, through the traditions of the elders and, and of their own communities, and have embraced as goods that, the, that can be counted upon uh, from community to community, that can be the basis for treaties, that can be the basis for uh, understandings of, of, of transnational or trans-community uh, inter cooperation and interaction. Um, that classic understanding mm -hmm. of the jus gentium is, is a, is, was what was celebrated uh, by the 17th and 18th century uh, formulators of the international law, uh, first of the sea and then of trade and then of the lex mercatori and eventually of the public international law. Mm -hmm. uh, human rights in their modern instantiation are in many ways ingredients, the currency of that jus gentium. The, the way of thinking about how can we formulate crisply what we hold in common as peoples, not hermetically that they can't be changed and not uh, as a substitute for, for what we formulate in our own faith communities as the ideals, but nonetheless as basic axioms. So protections of life, protections of liberty, protections of property, assurances of due process, mm -hmm. assurances of, of uh, no cruel and unusual punishment, protections of our of our basic way of life could be formulated in these um, human rights instruments. And, and what the Universal Declaration of Human Rights does in 1948 is gives us one really powerful distillation of that. The same way that in 1789 and 1791 we formulated a Bill of Rights which considered to be essential to the community of America. The various states competing as they were nonetheless could agree mm -hmm. upon basic rights formulations. And we, you can find other examples of of ways of looking at human rights as, as capturing the ideals, um, giving freedom to the faith communities to be able to pursue their own ideals, to have the, f the free exercise rights that they need to enjoy, uh, and to uh, articulate the norms of justice and liberty and dignity that are critical to, uh, and, and indeed essential expression, given an essential expression in uh, human rights formulations. But uh, so, so, so how does that relate to the specific character of those rights as human rights. They in, in here there are part and parcel of human beings, yeah. qua human beings, and therefore universal, and therefore one might expect uh, from some perspective, well, unchangeable, uh, kind of rock solid. Uh, what I hear you speak is that there's kind of the history of mm. the human rights. How, how do you relate these uh, two? Well, it's interesting when, when, if you look at the at the history of rights development in the Western tradition, mm -hmm. um, it's a, an instructive anecdote. For example, that by 1650, uh, every one of the rights that becomes part of the U.S. Bill of Rights of 1789 was already defended, 
theoretically formulated and fought over by Protestants who were trying to understand what does it mean to have the right as a religious believer to freedom of conscience and free exercise of one's faith. Mm. And what they, what they began to develop is to think about, well, we need to figure out what are the grounds on which we can articulate um, a basis for revolting against the authorities that are in place. The authorities are vice regents of God. We have to respect them, but we cannot allow those authorities to violate our core claims of conscience. Well, what are those? Mm, well, mm. over time, as, as the Protestant tradition, and you can do the same story in other traditions, as the Protestant tradition began to think about what are the essentials that we have to have in place bef that would allow us uh, to justify a revolt against an authorized official, a tyrant, as we see it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's think about those. Well, it's the right to obey with the Ten Commandments. It's the right to have the rights of religion in the first table, the rights of civil community in the second table. Well, what are they? Well, it's the rights to worship, the rights to be free from blasphemy, the rights to be free from forced uh, participation in swearing oaths. Um, what are the civil rights? Well, the, the flip side of the Ten Commandments. It's the right to have our family, the rights to have our life, the rights to have our property, the rights to have our reputation, the mm -hmm. rights to be free from assault. And as, as they began to think about other biblical foundations on which they could formulate rights claims, Protestants then thought, well, there are other ways of thinking about Scripture. Well, what do you have? We have this formulation, for example, in the, in the New Testament, that we are all called to be prophets, priests, and kings. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means, among other things, that we have the right to speak as a prophet. We have the right to worship as a priest. We have the right to rule and participate in rule as a mm -hmm. king begin to look at the, at the Hebrew Bible and to look at formulations about sanctuary, about protection of the poor, about jubilee, and begin to think hard through what that ultimately means for a person's rights claim. What Protestants were doing in this micro example is playing with their scriptural texts in the exigency of the political moment, how to decide, mm -hmm. how to decide what is the basis for revolt against the tyrant, and deciding what are the essential natural rights that we have as humans qua humans that would, number one, need to be protected, and number two, would trigger a, a revolt against the tyrant that would violate those as fundamentals. Mm -hmm. If you do that same story in the Catholic tradition from the 12th to the 18th century, in the Muslim tradition, in the various schools of jurisprudence that emerged before the closing of the door in the 9th century, you do the same thing in looking at covenantal duties in the Jewish tradition, you ultimately have multiple ways by which faith communities have looked at their own canonical scriptures, have looked at their own faith traditions and decided, well, these are certain fundamentals uh, that we can claim as humans and that we can ultimately project upon all humans as essential to their existence as persons. Mm -hmm. And if you put all that together, you eventually have a very thick, what theologians, you theologians would call a theological anthropology of human rights. What does it mean to be mm -hmm. a human? To be a human, as the canonical traditions have taught us, is to have a certain set of basic claims that cannot be trespassed. What human rights in the 20th century are, are in many ways the distillation of those long reflections, some of which go back uh, two millennia or more. You have given us here uh, a, a kind of very, very, very brief and really compelling sketch about how religious, various religious uh, traditions, uh, most extensively uh, in, in your narrative, the Protestant, but obviously other traditions as well, has contributed to the formulation of what we know now as a human rights. Sometimes uh, today people claim that uh, rights tradition is a secular uh, tradition. Indeed, religious folks often claim that mm. uh, in order to differentiate themselves right. from that uh, from that tradition. How would you how would you uh, describe the, the kind of uh, enlightenment sensibilities uh, of more secular type uh, playing with? Uh, uh, counterbalancing, uh, building on the religious claims in the history of uh, development of human yeah. rights. I think the Enlightenment in part lives off the capital uh, of faith traditions prior to the 18th century that formulated rights in particular ways. Uh, the understanding, for example, of the social contract in many ways is a secular instantiation of I ideals about the social and political and ecclesiastical covenants about which the traditions have rich and deep reflections. The notion of human dignity, uh, in some sense, in, in its Enlightenment formulation, is a, a secularized version of the faith tradition's understanding of what it means to be the image bearer of God. Mm. Uh, the notions of, of the basic uh, rights to, to life, to liberty, to property, are in many ways crisp summaries of long traditions of religious thought that go into uh, 
formulating what does it mean for a person to have life before God? What does it mean for the person to have liberty to discharge the duties of the faith? What does it mean for the person to dress and to keep the garden as a holder of property? The mm -hmm. Enlightenment lives off the capital of, of a lot of those ideas. And as I said in my anecdote a few minutes ago, uh, there is a fairly crisp summary of a lot of those rights formulations in place already uh, before the Enlightenment breaks mm. out. So somebody like Locke, who is a closet, who is a uh, uh, cradle Puritan, uh, who grows up in a, in a thick Anglo-Puritan environment, he's living off the capital of a lot of those ideas. But the, the burden of the Enlightenment was to try to find a way of formulating those rights claims that didn't necessarily depend upon the religious languages from which they emerged. Mm. Uh, mm. And part of that was born of necessity, uh, the world w was beset by, world w by religious warfare of various sorts. The world was beset by the constant tension between Catholics and Protestants and then warring sections within each of those faith communities. Uh, there was a very deep question about the perennial pariah of the Western tradition, Jews, and how to in incorporate them back into the, into, uh, the Western tradition. There was the growing conflict with, with Islam. Uh, there was the issue of what to do with indigenous peoples encountered through colonization. And what the Enlightenment project was in part was to say, is there a way of thinking about these traditional normative claims that we call rights or jus or libertas or freedoms mm -hmm. in the Western tradition in explicitly theological ways and to formulate them in abstract secular ways that didn't necessarily depend upon uh, a God hypothesis, mm -hmm. didn't depend upon the thick faith language that that was presupposed in earlier formulations, so they can and be the, shared, and, and they can be shared by by yeah. others, and they could be they could be a sh they could be the basis for treaties, for conventions, for ways of understanding that could be embraced by people of various faith traditions or cultural traditions, and eventually become the, the new nomenclature for the world order. You have to remember what the Enlightenment was trying to substitute uh, in the West was what Christendom had provided four centuries before and which the Reformation ultimately broke up and balkanized. Mm. Western Christendom, canon law, a universal church, a universal faith, one faith, one territory, one baptism, had mm. been the 12th to 16th century paradigm in the West. It provided the language, it was cast in rights terms, but it was exclusive and monopolistic in its formulation. Mm. 16th to the 18th century, the experience of the world was a fractured, balkanized world uh, which could not live with those faith claims in their multiple formulations, and the Enlightenment in many ways captured in its formulation of public, private, international law, and as well eventually in formulations of rights, ways of thinking about living together as persons and peoples regardless of our different faith convictions, and eventually celebrating pluralism and making it the natural check and balance against the excess or monopolization or establishment of one, any one faith tradition. I mean, Madison's fav famous Federalist Paper Number 10, where he celebrates factionalism. Hmm. What is the point of that? The point of that is to say, look, let a multitude of flowers bloom. Let a multitude of factions war with one another. Let a multitude of faiths coexist in a community, and they'll provide, quote, a censor more among the other. Mm. Keep one from becoming monopolistic over another. And then ultimately putting in place an establishment clause in the First Amendment that would ensure there was a legal protection if that natural check and balance didn't work. Mm. It's, so a, it's, a, it's, an it's an ingenious way of, mm. of trying to make the best of, of a tough world order in the 18th century, and it eventually, but it eventually becomes a, a technique of, of consociation, uh, which has worked for two centuries since. And in a sense, the challenge today is what has been done for the Western world to do in a different register for the world, uh, world as a whole. That's exactly right. right. That's and exactly right, and that's the big, that's the huge challenge that, that uh, worldwide science, worldwide economy, uh, worldwide media, uh, worldwide literature, hmm. uh, and increasingly world law and world human rights has to achieve. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, th I think that's the big burden on us in the, in the 21st century, is, to, is to, find, to find a language, to find a set of institutions, a set of normative practices, a set of mutual expectations that everyone around the world will take for granted. And it's very hard when some of the starting premises, yeah. uh, namely self-preservation, preservation of one's own life, is now being blown up in, in, in various kinds of, of um, uh, suicide bombings. It's very hard to presume uh, a common um, obligation of stewardship where we would think that the last thing we want to do is to destroy the world around us mm. and where that is, is, is still contested in various parts of the world.
And it's very difficult to do that when, when certain starting points about gender parity or the, or the, the preciousness of lo the life of a child or, or other basics that were presupposed, sometimes not even articulate, but presupposed mm. in, in uh, the rights formulations of the 18th century are, are still very much up for grabs. Uh, but it's interesting you say some of these, some of these things are, uh, of course, uh, coded in religious terms, some of these differences, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and at the same time, um, you say, um, from my perspective, I think rightly, that uh, we also need religious traditions, the, the, the rights languages need religious traditions. Uh, and vice versa, that religious traditions need uh, rights, uh, rights right. language. Could you explicate that, that relationship between the, between the two? Why does one need the other uh, and does so in, in a very much a globalized world yeah. in which we are searching for these kind of common uh, language and common yeah. institutions? The easier one is why religion needs human rights and just ask the persecuted uh, religious believers in various parts of the world are being slaughtered by the tens of thousands by reason of their faith convictions and, mm. and uh, appreciating freedom of conscience, basic freedom of exercise, basic assurance of procedural uh, rights, basic uh, protections of their uh, group's identity, basic ability to have collective property, to bury their dead, to educate their children. Um, those rights can't be taken for granted around the world today, and, and religious persecution is, mm. is real, uh, it's palpable, it's tragic, uh, and in many ways, human rights, re religious communities need human rights guaranteed to them as a universal in order for that kind of uh, tragic uh, and sometimes outrageous behavior to end and to provide a, at minimum, um, a, a basis for uh, mobilizing shame against those that would persecute if not providing grounds for uh, pursuit uh, of lawsuits and other kinds of, of political uh, mm -hmm. remedies to uh, offset the, uh, the tragedy that besets a lot of those communities around the world. And, and religious persecution is unfortunately alive and well in this world today. We don't hear about it on the right. front page of the papers, but it's a, it's a huge issue. And it's not just um, people in Rwanda or Burundi uh, or in Chechnya. It's in many places of the world. There are 130 uh, major civil wars going on, and many of those uh, religious factors are an important part of the prejudice and the persecution. Mm. So I think that side is relatively mm. easy. The flip side is a harder one. Why does human rights need religion? Uh, part of that is an argument about religion and religious rights are the conceptual and the historical source uh, for many of the rights that we hold dear today. Mm -hmm. The right of the individual to believe and to exercise his or her belief leads ineluctably to the rights to speak, to worship, to associate, to travel, to parent, to educate, uh, this, uh, and, and to participate in one's religious community on the basis of one's religious beliefs. For the, for the religious group, the right to exist leads to the rights to corporate property, to corporate organization, to organized charity, to parochial um, education, to a variety of other basic rights attached to religious communities. Religion provides oftentimes a starting point, especially in transitional democracies, uh, for the, f the first rights that get protected that eventually give rise to the, to the complementary and correlative rights that are essential. Um, religion um, is also an important check upon the limitless expansion of human rights. Many religious communities claim uh, rights, not just in the abstract, but claim rights in order to discharge the duties of the faith. Mm. Rights and duties in those religious communities belong together. Uh, rights without Duties and quickly become claims of self-indulgence. Duties without rights quickly become sources of deep guilt. Rights mm. and duties are organically connected, mm. and by religious communities are often the best stewards for showing the necessary connection between the two and then putting limits on rights expansion to simply a set of whimsical wants and wishes. Right, and, um, so, and so, rights, so rights simply as, uh, as claims for myself, right? Religious right. traditions situate those rights uh, situate as a care rights. For, for rights for right. others as well, not yes. just for oneself. Exactly, there, uh, it's the duties to oneself, to one's faith, to one's mm. faith community, to one's family, uh, ultimately to one's God. In the Christian tradition, it's the right to discharge the duties of love to God, neighbor, and self. I mean, that's mm. really what faith uh, communities help rights uh, articulate for themselves. There's a third thing, and that, and that is that religious communities often are the institutions, uh, especially again in transitional democracies, that help to vindicate rights. You can't mm. depend upon the state as the only protector and guarantor and vindicator of rights in a lot of communities around the world. Mm. You've got to defend yourself the, o o over against the state, right? Yeah, <laughs> often against the state and often, right. often uh, prophetic 
prototypical yeah. of yeah. what the state needs to do. I mean, if you think about religious communities in especially colonial autocracies or in, in, in colonies or in autocracies in the 1970s through 90s, uh, religious communities really are the zones of liberty. They are the place that provides some of the prototypes for the first generation civil and political rights. Mm -hmm. They are often the communities that provide a principal, if not the exclusive means to vindicate second generation rights of health care and education and charity, artistic, labor, and other opportunities. And religious communities provide some of the deepest ingredients and understandings of creation, of stewardship, of trusteeship, uh, and of servanthood that lie at the heart of what we call third generation rights of peace, order, uh, orderly mm -hmm. development, and environmental protection. So religious communities are essential allies. And then you can think about religious ideas as, in, in many ways, the, the, set, the scale of values and the sources of values which a human rights community presupposes. Religious communities provide the, the sources of, mm -hmm. of restraint and respect, of, of protection uh, for the other, for the vulnerable, provide ingredients and, and examples of accountability and responsibility that a human rights regime ultimately presupposes and, and needs in order to be made real. Um, and, and in that sense, religious communities, because they are so ineradicably intersected in, in public and private life, because they are an ineradicable, ineradicable condition of human communities, religious communities have to be dealt with. And human rights communities that pretend that religious communities can simply be either dismissed in the private sphere or religious uh, rights activists that talk about uh, religion being a, a silly superstition that's eventually going to going to die a slow death uh, and and simply be consigned um, at best to uh, the hobby horse of, of the person that's contemplating um, life in the hereafter that understanding of, of religion is in many ways uh, been betrayed by uh, the last 30 years uh, of uh, this new great awakening of religion around the world. Religion has to be dealt with because it's there, it's there perennially, pervasively, profoundly, uh, and it's essential in many ways in providing the, the sources and scales of values that human rights communities presuppose in the vindication of their rights. And uh, would I be right to say that precisely these considerations as well make you argue that uh, religious rights are particularly significant to protect the protection of uh, re religious rights is a special case of protection of rights. Did I understand that yeah. correctly? Yeah, and, uh, and, it's, and that's captured in Article 18 of the, of the Universal Declaration, uh, mm -hmm. which has a set of basic uh, guarantees of freedom of conscience and freedom of exercise, the ability to choose and change one's religion, the ability to organize oneself in religious communities, to have the special exemptions and needs and immunities of those communities respected by uh, nation states that sign on to the Universal Declaration's values. Those views are elaborated in the 1966 Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. There's a further guarantee in, in Article 26 of the 66 Covenant about the need to ensure that communities do not engage in discrimination based on religious grounds, among others. Uh, religious rights simply provide the ability for the individual and the group to exist uh, and to exercise their faith, their faith convictions uh, singly and in community uh, together. And, and what, those, uh, what those basic rights are are elaborated in some detail in the 1981 uh, UN Declaration on Religious Intolerance mm. that has you know, eight fairly uh, thick provisions about right, what right. goes into a religious rights protection. Uh, and the Vienna Concluding Document in 1989 gives some further corporate free exercise examples. Now, you, you, you seem, from, uh, from, the, from the tenor of this conversation, you seem uh, hopeful about the future of, uh, of uh, human rights uh, in our globalized world, maybe even hopeful about uh, creation of uh, common institutions in the globalized world. Um, uh, but of course, hopefulness is essential, uh, essential virtue. Uh, what do you think uh, we can concretely do to stimulate, whether we are academic or activists, in order to stimulate um, more vigorous discussion as well as implementation in particular of human rights across the globe uh, so as to provide uh, the kind of environment in which we would be able to live a stable and peaceful life? There's no substitute, first of all, for protecting the rights of people on the ground that have not had those rights protected. Two-thirds of the world uh, 
suffer fundamental rights violations every day. And fundamental rights to food, to shelter, to basic liberty, to gender equality, to protection of their children, to access to health care, to basic procedural due process rights. The first and foremost way of making human rights uh, an ideal that is real for many people is to show on the ground in practical application what that means. Secondly, I think it's very important for us to understand that human rights are not the product of the Western Enlightenment, that human rights are not the, the privileging of liberty um, uh, to the exclusion of duty, not the, not the uh, triumph of the individual over the community, not the triumph of greed over charity, but in fact human rights are simply one way of talking about uh, the good life and the good society and how it can be achieved. And the more we can show that there are multiple ways of thinking about human rights, the more we can show the deep historical sources of human rights in a variety of faith and cultural communities, the more we can show analogs in other faith communities outside the West um, that have ideals, values, canonical prescriptions, normative practices that are consistent with, sometimes go beyond human rights, I think the better position will be. De will be. Third, I think it's very important that in the 21st century uh, we continue to press on the institutional structures that will make rights real at the transnational level. The United Nations, various regional, instru various regional uh, institutions that are out there continue to be relatively weak bodies. They right. continue to depend upon uh, cogency, the charisma, and other ingredients for effective enforcement. If we're going to make this real in the 21st century, uh, world rights are going to depend upon a world political community and a world political community that's more than simply an extension of the whims of the five superpowers or three superpowers or one superpower that might be in place at one given time. Hmm. Uh, and increasingly, I think that obligates us to take very seriously the emerging superpowers uh, of India and China uh, that, are, that are emerging in the global economy and that eventually are going to be part of uh, the infrastructure of, of uh, any kind of, of world understanding of what political responsibility means. I think fourth and finally, I think what's important is that um, to do the exercise that I mentioned a few minutes ago, that faith communities, cultural communities have to use the human rights paradigm today as a mirror in which to reflect upon themselves, as a way of, of mobilizing shame against falling short of its own ideals, mm. as a way of thinking about um, how their own ideals, their core understandings of peace and fraternity of brotherly and sisterly love and affection that are at the core of every religious community can be realized anew in this way of thinking about uh, what human rights are and what are essential to our human nature and our human society. Um, and, to, and to find ways of translating their own cultural, canonical, uh, and religious understandings uh, of the good life and the good society uh, into terms that can be understood by insiders and outsiders alike. The human rights community has to be open to that. It has to be open to new formulations of the good life and the good society that go beyond what the Universal Declaration and its progeny has produced. Uh, the, the, in turn, these religious communities have to develop their own internal religious hermeneutics, hermeneutics of human rights, hermeneutics of confession, showing how they've fallen short, hermeneutics of suspicion, not simply capitulating to any one particular formulation of human rights, and then hermeneutics of history going back to their own traditions and reclaiming their own voices and values in the human rights dialogue. John, thank you for this very stimulating conversation and thank you especially for the challenge at the very end of that conversation. Let's hope that we can take it on and uh, achieve a greater measure of peace uh, grounded in respect for human rights. Thank, thank you very you. much. Good to be here. Thank you.